Thanks. Hi, welcome everyone. We're just waiting for people to roll in this morning. We'll get started in a few minutes. Welcome everybody, thanks for coming. We're just waiting for people to roll in and um, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Thank you for coming. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome again, everyone. Um, I am Jason Vardakar. I'm a PhD candidate in art history at Stanford University and the curator of special projects um, at the Hunter and Art Museum. Today, I'm excited to introduce an artist lecture by Janine Wong whose work in media not limited to wood turning, basket weaving and furniture attends to the complex and sometimes uneasy relation between human beings and the design objects we encounter. Janine Wong is a Philadelphia based artist and furniture maker. She holds an architecture degree from Cooper Union and an MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD. She has exhibited at many schools and galleries, including the Aramont School of Crafts, Arts and Crafts, the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, the Appalachian Center for Craft, the Peters Valley School of Craft, and the State Museum of Philadelphia. This event is part of a series hosted by the Hunter and Art Museum in conjunction with the Fall 2020 exhibition, Up Now, which is called From the Ground Up, Peters Valley School of Craft, 
curated by Elizabeth Esner. For that exhibition, resident artists have made their work in the museum's first floor galleries, October through December, as part of its programming. And this coming Friday, December 11th, Wong will start her residency. I encourage everyone to safely see this excellent exhibition, which is up through January 10th at the museum. I wanna take a brief moment to thank our funders. This program was made possible in part by a grant from the New Jersey Council for the Humanities, a state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional support for this exhibition was provided by the Windgate Foundation and the Marie and John Zimmerman Fund. Museum programs are made possible in part by funds from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, a partner agency of the National Endowment for the Arts, the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation, and other corporations, foundations, and individuals. Thank you. So without further ado, um, Janine, um, I invite you to go ahead and, and start your talk. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. Um, so hi, and thank you for that introduction. Um, and thanks the Hundred Inn Art Museum and everybody who works there for this opportunity, as well as Peters Valley and Elizabeth Esner for making this all possible. Um, I am an artist and furniture maker. Um, I'm mostly a wood turner and I make my living as a woodworker. Um, unlike a lot of the really crazy artists and crafts people in this show, I, I don't have decades of illustrious making experience. Um, I, I've been building in earnest for maybe four or five years. And um, I mean, I'm excited. I feel like there's a lot to look forward to. And this presentation just kind of goes over where I'm at so far. I'm sorry if you could hear sirens, by the way. I live on a very busy street in Philadelphia. Um, and I was born and raised in New York. So I wanted to start here just to kind of say that I didn't really have the quintessential growing up woodworking, um, like in my dad's garage experience that a lot of my peers have. I grew up in the city and um, I started commuting to school at the age of 11. Um, I wouldn't trade it for anything because it was super liberating. Um, if you commute as a middle or high schooler in the city that you get this like three ride Metro card where every day you get three free rides and that's one to school, one back home. And then you kind of have one to like stop somewhere, anywhere before you go home. Uh, so I, my friends and I would just do very wholesome things like go to the Met or go to the MoMA or pretty much take care of ourselves um, throughout all of middle and high school. And this is me at the Met, um, drawing with a friend. We did this for fun, just kind of because we could. And that was a pretty normal day. Um, so yeah, this is a slide from a presentation I did a couple of years ago, but I find it still rings true. So I'm just gonna go ahead and read it. Hopefully the video's in the way. Um, bigger drawings really changed my life. Um, this is a drawing from when I was 17. When it comes to figure drawing, it was the blind contour that really did it for me. And so that's when you take a pen and you don't look down on your page, you look at your subject and then use a single line to take down as much information about the person or object that you're drawing, just using attention to contour. And that kind of lets you ditch that self-consciousness we sometimes feel when we draw because you forget about things like looking right and you can concentrate on the pure transfer and digestion of information. And I mean, I know that a lot of us struggle with, you know, the, the fear of the blank page, but I find a lot of the time you just get yourself to do something, something like a blind contour, that's what'll really kick you off and get you going. 
So this is a drawing from six years later um, when I was in college. My best friend, who is also in the class from which this was born, I watched her grow as a drawer into an incredible illustrator and animator with a style very different from mine. Uh, she would grasp the understanding of the internal structure of things. So, and would just draw bodies and objects with one sure line with like confidence that they were right. Um, I was never really sure of a line until it was actually there. So I, I wing things, I edit them, I smudge lines around till they're right or exaggerate the bits and lumps that I like a lot. Um, feeling the line, that's translated into my tactile appreciation of things. And that's my favorite thing about drawing the organic. Um, it's my favorite thing about people, about bodies, and it's my favorite thing about turning. Um, so this is just one drawing from a series I did where I watched people work for hours and then just tracked them until all of the marks kind of like conglomerated into one thick body that I thought was the most accurate like portrait representation of the essence of that person. And I mean, what I noticed was people, I mean, now as a furniture maker, like I can see the outline of the furniture that people are in and it, people move when they work. Even when you're sitting still on the computer, um, we're constantly just shifting and moving because that's what we naturally need. And um, I frequently find it very frustrating to contort myself to be in that like very right angled lowercase h type of chair shape. So this was one of my first wood turnings. Um, and I, I don't know, I like felt almost the same way about wood turning that I did about drawing where it, I was, you can translate a line into a body and that line then becomes like a doubly curved surface, which is a very difficult thing to do otherwise. And it's a shape like doubly curved surfaces are something that the human body really likes because that's what we're made out of. We're not made out of right angles and flat surfaces. We're made out of stuff that shaped like that. Um, then I went to architecture school. Uh, that was a very unhappy time, but I did learn to draw in a completely different way. Um, I don't know, I like couldn't, I just wasn't happy doing it. There was, it felt very unnatural and very rigid. And I guess I wasn't very good at it because I got suspended for a year. Um, and during that year, I went soul searching and took on a, like three different jobs in, um, in retail and architecture and then in furniture making with Takashi Miyakawa who had a wood shop in Greenpoint. And that was, that was my like first experience of what a wood shop really is. It's, um, it's, well, the way he ran his, it was kind of this like place where you live and breathe making things. And so like anytime he needed anything, he would just go ahead and make it like we, Set. This was the beginnings of, I think he has like a straight up legit kitchen in there now, um, but we would like cook meals, talk about work, have it all around us, and that was amazing. Um, so my first piece of furniture that I ever made was in his studio. It was stairs for my dog, my old friend, who uh, she was really big, like she was about broaching a hundred pounds at that time and had developed really bad arthritis. And the way to counter arthritis is to like exercise and work more. So we would take her on hikes, but she eventually just couldn't get in the car anymore. So I made this collapsible set of uh, stairs, which were also adjustable for the two cars that we had at the time. And um, you can see on the upper left, 
that I like iterated a couple of versions before finally going out and building this at real scale. Um, and fun little story, the, uh, the little paw prints are actually scorched on there with a torch. So you can see in this picture on that second top step, we had a stencil and then just burnt it just right to get those little paw prints in. Oh, and this is wood turning. So the video doesn't work, not surprising. Should have tested this, I'm sorry. But um, basically what happens is I have a machine and the machine will hold a piece of wood and spin that piece of wood really, really quick. And then I'll hold a tool, a sharp tool up to the object and the spinning of the machine basically hits my sharp edge and carves itself. It's really gratifying. <laughs> and um, it's, it engages your entire body and um, you become part of the tool. And you, it's, it's a very immediate and exciting experience that I'd never, I'd never experienced drawing a line like this. <laughs> Um, so this was my first project at RISD. I carried through some of the, the ideas that um, I developed during that portrait series to this project. And um, I wanted to make a piece of furniture that would allow for you to be the natural human that you are. And so um, in this model here, which was a very bad idea, um, every every one of those little lengths of PVC had, um, it could spin freely. So if you lay it on it, you could like move yourself up and down the whole thing. Um, it was actually very restrictive because your entire body was on there and just sliding around. Um, but I wanted to experiment with the idea of putting two spindles, like two uh, wood turned things next to each other so that their, um, the lines, their silhouettes would nest into each other. And I found that what that did was create, you know, not just the doubly curved surface of the spindle, but then a third complex surface in a, in a planar dimension. And what I came up with was this. It, it was um, the combination of those two things, but you don't, you don't, your whole body is not rolling. Uh, so all of these spindles nest together and they all spin freely. And so that gives you a surface that you can sit on that you can like fidget and move around. And um, my favorite thing about it was that just for for a bunch of hard lumpy things put together like that, it was incredibly comfortable. And I mean, that's just the power of curves and movement at work. Um, then I did, I, I sort of got obsessed with this pattern of beads. Um, so I turned this pattern of beads to the exact dimensions of my, my fingers so that when I grip it, it's insanely comfortable, um, very satisfying. And you just kind of get the feeling of like, mm. um, I, um, I'd also been thinking about, I guess, thanks to like architecture <laughs> education um, about like, why, I mean, there, there's a whole book by Adolf Luce called Crime and Ornament where he basically rails against ornament as like some evil that humans have come up with. So I was wondering as I was slowly learning to turn things totally new to the field and never having like even known this was a process before, um, why people use this method to make like just decoration. Um, a lot of the turning that you see in like everyday life, it's like, stair spindles or um, like chair backs or maybe like the, I don't know, like molding. 
Um, but I wanted to, uh, I wanted to do more than just that, um, more than just, you know, let spindle turning be ornamental and was thinking about a way to activate it. So this table was um, made with that in mind. I took that pattern and then just stuck it under the aprons of my table so that the table would be really pleasant to grab and move around and invite you to go ahead and like take it with you or get it to do whatever you needed instead of you know mildly unpleasant, which sharp edges would have been. And so it's actually, the dimensions of it are not really table height. They're kind of a little ambivalent. Like it's in between like table and bench and just it, I, I wanted to ask the user to do what they wanted with it rather than be like very restrictive and uh, didactic. And um, yeah, I just thought, hey, the table should come second. And I made the table into a frame for that ornament. Um, I also made a whole bunch of one-legged stools, which I got obsessed with for a while. Um, a one-legged stool is, it's a stool that has a seat plate, but then only one leg. And the idea of that is that stool, it needs you. And um, so instead of, well, instead of like contorting yourself into an object that we're all familiar with, what ended up happening was I made these stools and people just like didn't know what to do with them. And they made all these crazy combinations and different uses that I thought were so beautiful. Um, oh, I didn't explain what a one legged stool is. Okay, it's just one leg and it requires you to sit on it and use your own two legs to be the other two legs. So it kind of, um, it, it makes sitting a collaborative effort between you and your chair. And um, it engages your sense of proprioception, which is your ability to like, close your eyes, touch your nose, and know where your body is in space at all times. And so um, the, I had a guy who's like a woodworker and a yogi um, once sit in one of my chairs, uh, one-legged stools, and he said that it helped him like center himself. And that's so true. You can just feel where like the center of gravity really is like that string inside your body that is your axis. Um, this is the concrete comforter. It was inspired by the idea of um, like, the, the comforter in the landscape of the bed being the perfect piece of furniture because you can pretty much just like take the whole thing and toss it in a corner and then it becomes like a chair that you can lean back up against or you can like take it and smoosh it into your lap and it becomes a laptop table. Um, I wanted to bring the comforter out of the land of the bed into the land of furniture and um, I made this piece where if you operate it, it can kind of become whatever you need it to be. Um, these are, well, this is the snug stones. Um, it was inspired by my experience as a high schooler of like roaming free through Central Park, not having that much, had that much experience with nature before. Um, Central Park is kind of like an idealized version of nature. It was designed by um, Frederick Law Olmsted, who really just wanted, I forget what the quote is. He said he wanted the landscape to be like every time you turned a corner, every view should feel like a new perspective of inhabitants. So if you see a lot of like paintings of Central Park from back in the day, it would just be, it would literally be like picture paintings of a landscape. Like you'd look in and you could be like, wow, it looks beautiful. I just want to go there and figure out where I fit in. And so um, I would say it was hugely successful. I spent a lot of time as a kid just crawling over and like trying to find where my body fit amongst like the rocks the trees, the perfect mound of grass. 
Um, I wanted to recreate that, but like inside the home. So uh, inside each one of these stuck stones, which is all covered in like very homogenous um, occluding felt and wool, um, is secrets. So I upholstered secret like sitting experiences inside of each one. Like on the left, that's an air cushion and that's in that little guy. You would never know it until you sat down, but you kind of like sit down and then, whoa, you have really good posture. Um, I had garden gate springs in the seat of the big one, as well as a hard top on top, which would let you put things down, um, I don't know, like mugs or a book. And in the rug one is super fluffy latex. So it just smooshes in with pressure. And um, I didn't want them to be very didactic. So I just, um, you were supposed to move them around and fit them with you and fit yourself into whatever landscape you choose. Um, and that was risky. I had a very hectic little studio and that's pretty much still accurate. After school, I went and did the Windgate International Attorney Exchange at the Center for Art and Wood here in Philly. I was the student artist, so I was the greenie. Um, and I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about wood turning really either. And there wasn't much to, uh, there wasn't much in the way of technique, techniques taught, although the facilities were all there. And we just, we saw so much wood turning. Um, I, I don't think I'll ever see just thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces. We would go on field trips to galleries, collectors' homes, talk with the people about them, to artist studios, and it was amazing. Um, for that residency, I did this series called Couple Cups. Not all of them are cups, but each one of these vessels was um, related to a gesture of holding. And so I, um, I worked with the photojournalist resident there, Tina Tamares, to do a photo series that corresponded with each one of the vessels. And just to be quick, the names are pretty uh, self-explanatory. Um, that is the, the first one on the left, going to the right is the hug mug, um, the power chalice, the hors d'oeuvres, which you held in between your fingers, um, offering one, offering two, uh, friendly fingers, which feels like holding someone's hand for the first time, which is a little weird, <laughs> very intimate. Um, this is, I did two more iterations of the power chalice, and one of them was the sweetened one. Um, second to last is the small latte, which is how I used to hold a small latte while like trudging down the street, and um, the food stabilizer. So this is just, this is kind of my typical process. I would draw something, um, imagine inhabiting that thing, make the thing and like edit while I was on the lathe. And then um, once it came off, I could iterate and do another one. I almost do, I do almost nothing the first try around. Um, this was a project I did with the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education here in Philly. Um, this was just, this was a project to spread awareness about the emerald ash borer, which is an invasive species in North America, came from Asia. Um, it is going to make you, you might have heard of ash trees because they're a really common domestic tree in America. They're all going to be extinct because of this little beetle. Um, they, they came to the States, I think, in 2007 and have been unstoppable, slowly spreading state across state, beginning in Michigan. And they're here in Philly and Pennsylvania. So um, the only thing we can really do to stop them is slow them. And the only way to slow them is to just kill any ash trees as soon as you notice that they're infected. Um, so this tree just came down the day before I went to collect wood. Um, 
the arborist there, Steve, went to collect pieces with me and helped me get them cut and put in my car. And he showed me all the ways that a tree really manifests its pain and sickness and suffering. Um, one of those ways is, for example, in the upper right, it'll open up fissures where it just can't keep its skin closed anymore. And an unhealthy tree is, it doesn't have the energy to go and close those fissures back up. And so that's how you know it's just doomed because it's just gonna stay open and rot comes riding on in and weakens the entire tree. Um, as soon as the rot penetrates into the trunk, that tree is going to rot and die. So this is just a branch and you can kind of see inside of it, if you look really close over here, um, there are little like very distinctive bug trails that are distinctive to the emerald dash borer. I made these pieces called Holding On in the Aftermath. Um, I think one of the really poignant things about wood and trees is that trees don't just die and disappear. They get to live on as wood. And so if there's nothing that we can do, I mean, I'm no scientist, if there's nothing we can do to save the trees until, um, you know, we're there, wait, the trees are waiting for a vaccine. Sounds very familiar. Um, then what we can do is to bring them into our homes as wood and acknowledge their lives and um, what we've lost by losing them. So um, every one of these wall hung cabinets uses a piece of that, this guy <laughs> up here and highlights a part of that tree where it was showing its sickness. So for example, fissure, very direct. Um, I wanted to just highlight the, the injury and then bring some sort of human affordance in so that we could just hold right onto it and create a connection between species. Um, callus and wood, the uh, wound, this a callus wood, well, wound wood is what forms when a tree has to drop its branch because it just, it decides it's not worth trying to fight that infection anymore and just got to cut it off right there. And callus wound, uh, callus wood forms over it. Um, this was a nightstand that I made with my partner who is also a woodworker. Um, it was a reaction to a very bad nightstand that I had. Um, it was this like flat, pack gray box that my little brother didn't even want and my mom shipped it to me and it was supposed to be a nightstand but in a nightstand you put things that are just so personal to you um and it's like right by where you sleep when you're where you're sleeping when you're most vulnerable it just felt gross to use that thing I was living in like a warehouse at the time where people had slowly one by one built up all of these, these, their own like DIY living spaces. And just to have something so uh, cold, like that was just disturbing. So um, Brian is a steam bender and he steam bent one of my turnings, which um, was split in half. And we created a nightstand that was everything you don't want anyone to see. Um, I also worked with this like super badass lady wood turner. You can see her in the blue jackets on the bottom two corners. Um, she has a wood turning studio not too far from me right now um, where we well, she's like a proper turner, so I actually lear finally learned how to do wood turning with her while working with her. Um, we the, the highlight of that job, though, was teaching a class entirely made up of teenage girls. Um, they were part of the Police Athletic League here in Philadelphia, which is like an after school program to help keep like kids from the local neighborhood um, occupied with something to do instead of sitting alone at home. Um, and a lot of these girls just, I mean, they, 
They were so awesome. They learned so fast. They walked in with no building experience whatsoever. And that was crazy to me. Um, like we asked them, like who here has held a hammer before? And literally one girl raised her hand. Uh, she was also the only girl who had ever used a power drill before. And so at the beginning, they were all really hesitant. They walked in kind of just being like, oh my God, we're gonna do what? And like, we turn on the machine and just see them back away. Um, but by the end of, it was like a 10 week program. These girls were just like walking in and then like tying up their hair and being like, what are we gonna do today? You know what? I wanna paint. And so um, it was just amazing to see like the difference in confidence that they all had. Um, I, uh, this is the first time I ever went to Peters Valley. I went for a basket making workshop with Pamela Wilson. And that's actually my mom, who I know is listening. Hi, mom. Um, that was wonderful. Um, we made a few baskets over a weekend. And at the end of everything, I asked Pamela if like, it would be okay if I went around and asked my classmates for all of their leftover weaving materials. And then just, I took that home. I was so excited about it. Um, and I wove a whole bunch of baskets on my own probably for like a couple years. Um, the, the really wonderful thing about um, basket making is that it's, I mean, I guess those are like the two worlds that I'm really familiar with right now. Um, compared to wood turning, where you need like machines and a lathe and a lot of tools, and it's just like hundreds, thousands of dollars worth of investment in like a space. With basket making, all you need is just the materials. You need um, like natural materials. You can even forge them yourself and like a bowl of water and your fingers. And so, um, a while after that course, after I'd been practicing and making small things for a while, I went to a, a um, week-long residency at Aramont School of Craft called the Spring Pentaculum, um, where they invite all artists from all fields that they cover to the school for a week to come work. And um, I mean, out, as a like working, <laughs> person it is so hard to make time like that so I was thrilled and I wanted to try this thing that I thought would maybe be possible to create a fully enclosed basket sphere which um I think I wove for maybe like 15 hours straight to get that um and then I filled it with light and so this was the, um, the light actually, I was referencing like a, a fishing lure or the peacefulness that we find in fishing, which was also new to me, introduced by my partner. Um, and you can slip that cord through that wooden tube. It's a wooden tube, not just a solid stem so that you can raise and lower um, your light and it just hangs freely, really gently. Um, so that, that stem is actually steam bent. So if you can see that bent piece of wood over my shoulder, um, that's when, oh, this was also supposed to be a video, I'm sorry, but you can heat up and basically cook a piece of wood so that all the, the um, lignin, which is like the, it's almost like glue, natural glue between wood fibers it loosens and softens up so that you have this like five or 10 minute window where you, it's very exciting. You like pull the wood out of the steamer and then um, you can actually bend it. So I don't know if you can see right here or even if you can see my mouse, but there's a piece of wood under clamped under that metal strap and it's bent over right here. Um, this is Brian, he was making a table leg for a friend. Um, and so I started collaborating with Brian because I was like, I had noticed here that these hoops that I'm weaving around, they're, uh, they're widely available from like basket making suppliers, but they're only circles. And 
Brian and I looked at them, we were like, these hoops are definitely steam bent. Why don't we try steam bending our own hoops? And so we embarked on a journey of combining with, uh, basket making with steam bending. Now uh, you can see here, that's also a light. And they kind of look like little grubs crawling all over the place. Um, I really like them. Um, we also prototyped this hanging pendant light where, um, but so that top piece is turned and the wavy frame around it is steam bent and the basketry basically connects that wavy line with that single point to create a surface. And I really like the way that this piece throws light on the wall. Um, I made this very tiny mini light just to kind of wet my feet. Um, it was sent to a show for the AAW, which is the American Association of Woodturners, where they asked for um, a whole bunch of artists from all over the, uh, wood turning artists from all over the world to make something that was really small, six by six by six. I made this during um, the quarantine. So it was a very isolating experience. Um, my studio at the time was in a small room in a huge dark basement in a building where no one else was. And I just felt like I was casting out a light a tiny little version of my world to go meet a whole bunch of other little smaller worlds at an international symposium that I yet to visit. So I had started integrating basketry with wood turning. Um, I wrote this article very recently. This came out in October for the AAW journal. Um, I think copies will be available at 102 if you want to check it out, um, where I just went through all the kinds of techniques that I go through to combine these two things. Um, it actually came from a lot of uh, experimentation over the past couple years that I've been leaving. And um, it, I'm tentatively calling it A plus B equals C. It comes from this thing that my dad told me as a kid which I guess was meant to be slightly discouraging. I don't know. He told me that like, there are a lot of people in this world and they're really good at what they do. You're never gonna be the best at A and you'll probably not find anything new in the direction B either. But if you combine A and B, you can make something totally new and novel, um, so go find C. I think he thought I might be a scientist or a doctor or something, but that didn't happen. <laughs> so this is where his lesson has led. Um, I, have, I have since seen some examples of wood turning combined with basketry, but before that, um, it seemed to be a totally untouched field. So this is actually named D. Um, e, also made during the quarantine, um, felt very landlocked. And I've been going and trying to collaborate with other artists as well. So I'm gonna be working on a copper form with the metal worker or silversmith, my friend Carson Sayo. And I was also sent this crazy hollow form by Shaw Studio which um, if you are wood turning, you know, these are really hard to make. I'm not that incredible at wood turning yet. So I'm excited about weaving into that one. Um, and this is my Philly studio. We, um, it, I share it with Brian and this, we just started building it out in August, but you can see it's already a mess, just like it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, and that's my talk. Okay, thank you so much, Janine, for um, that tour of your work and life and um, your 
various explorations in wood have, have much to uh, contribute, I think, to the Peters Valley exhibition and to larger conversations about um, the medium of wood turning and the um, expansive way that you engage with these materials um, in, syn you know, in a synthesis as your father taught you so beautifully that there's a synthesis possible or the A plus B is one way of saying a, um, a way of, of growing by innovating in, ver in the various ways that are possible, such as in a wood shop. So now I wanted to open up this conversation to the audience and we're in a special webinar mode, which means um, we won't be able to have a live conversation, um, which gets a little complicated uh, with these large Zoom calls, but please enter in um, any questions you have into the Q&A or into the chat and anything you ask, answer, comment will make it into the, um, into the conversation. So we only have, you know, about 10 minutes left or so. Um, so please, you know, if you have any questions for Janine or pertaining to questions of uh, the qu topics of craft or wood turning or whatever, please enter them into the chat and we'll get to them um, for sure. So thank you. Um, so Janine in the, a little bit more of a limited time that we have, we'll wait for questions to roll in and hopefully um, uh, respond to those. But um, I guess my initial question is about, um, about care and um, the kind of care and time and attention that goes into um, the, the process of wood turning. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit about um, what it feels like um, what kind of care, what kind of, well, yeah, what kind of affect there is in the process of turning a hunk of wood into this, as you say, doubly curved form that, you know, is inextricably tied to the doubly curved forms of our body and our uh, affective experiences, our sensuous experiences of the world. Yeah, so I wondered if you could say something about the feeling and affect of actually wood turning sure. itself. Yeah. Um... So it's a very hands-on process, which I love. Um, I can play the video, I have the video clip somewhere on my computer, maybe we can play it later, but um, generally what attracted me to woodworking as a whole is just um, the fact that you can really feel like the spirit or like the ghost of the maker kind of coming back to you when you use a piece of furniture. Mm. So, like even if you use like a, like have a tabletop that was handmade, you know that, you know, the top is sanded. It was all sanded by hand. The same person who made it felt the same thing as you and they wanted to like pass it on. So you can feel that in the top versus like say the bottom of the table, which is often not sanded because they knew that this was how it was. They wanted you to live and um, feel what they felt while making it. And so, I mean, I really think that when you like encounter a piece of furniture or a handmade object, the way your body fits into that thing, at least for physical objects, is it, it kind of like returns that intimate connection of the maker who made it right back to you. So they're speaking to you through the thing. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating um, idea, the way that um, the objects, uh, the, the wood, I guess, the wood grain, the texture of the wood uh, carries with it the life of the maker, which might seem like too much of a projection of the spiritual or religious into what mm. is often potentially would be considered like an abject, you know, piece of turned wood or something. But no, I completely agree with you. And I think there's um, those kinds of uh, those, that kind of knowledge, maybe that only an experienced wood turner such as yourself could have about, um, you know, how the wood speaks is something that is an incredibly important um, point and it's hard maybe in the kind of way that furniture is often displayed in museums, you know, is kind of these 
things or objects that we look at that are apart from us versus the very um, uh, sensuous experience of actually touching and feeling and being cradled by furniture, um, which then may invoke um, the various touches, past touches of the maker uh, who, who gave life or, you know, gave birth as it were to this, to this wood creation and contended with the life of the tree in that process. We have a lot of questions. So I'm just going to kind of pivot to the questions if that's okay. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I love that answer. I wish we could have a, there could be a, a thought bubble where we could have another discussion <laughs> about what you just said, but uh, for sake of time, I'll address some of the questions. Um, so I'll start with this one from Stephanie Sims, who asks the interesting question, um, what context do you see your objects, quote unquote, living their best life, end quote? Are they meant to be used as objects touched or experienced? Or do you see them more as what she calls visual gallery objects? But that's mm -hmm. a good kind of follow up to what we were just discussing. Yeah, um, I think, well, art kind of, it like creates a space of empathy for viewers oftentimes. So when you like think of a painting, what's really the art is like what's happening in between the person and the object. And it's kind of making, it, it's like creating an environment for encounter. And so I think for me, like what really strikes to my heart is when I can actually go and like get really close up to the thing and have the, um, like the design sensibilities, which tie a lot into my work. Um, for me, it's really important that the things get lived with. It, it makes me so happy to, like sometimes I do have to sell my work to someone who's just going to like put it there and keep, keep it really precious and never touch it. But for the most part, I try to make everything that I have like sturdy, life worthy and something that just gets richer with time as people use them. Yeah, and I think it gets to this larger question, your work um, about it, how the contours and forms relate to the, um, you know, to the curling of fingers, for example, around the decorative edge uh, of that table bench that you made. So how your works are relating to the way the body um, encounters them, utilizes them, grasps them, et cetera, that they are activated, um, can, you know, they're activated um, kinetically, as it were, by, um, by usage. And that is like your tree work, uh, which is um, the snug stones um, are activated, as you say, by their secret hidden armatures. So, yeah. Um, yeah um, so do you, do you think, speaking of the snug stones, um, we have a question from Sally Chen who asks, um, do you think you'll combine your more soft sculptures um, with wood turning in the future? Um, you know, there's a related question, which is, are there any themes you find yourself constantly drawn into your work? Hi, Sally. Um, yeah, definitely. I, like, my biggest problem with working is just not having enough time. Um, which is why I, I really like collaborating with other people. And I'm in, I, I, I'll, a lot of the craft community is all about just like being enthusiastic about everyone else's work and wanting to bring it together. Um, I, when it comes to upholstery, it's a very heavy um, craft and it is another whole craft that I definitely wanna bring in. Um, eventually. Uh, but for now, I think there's a lot of different ways in every field to address the same concepts. And so what the greatest thing that happens is when someone gets really deep into something and they're like on like they're, they're a total space cadet and you can like barely understand them, but they produce something that no one else would have gotten. And so I think once I get there with maybe a few methods, um, I, uh, speaking of like the A plus B equals C or like combining wood turning with upholstery, um, I, there's this thing called like the edge effect in ecology, which is the idea that um, at the edge of two environments, say like between the savanna and the desert, 
is where the most new species are formed. And that's where I wanna go. Like in the 21st century, there are edges everywhere and you can't get good at it all. But- um, That's can... great. Yeah, so that also goes to the, like you just said, the A plus B plus C I equals C idea. So um, I think, I, I love that you bring up like ecology. Um, you know, it reminds me of the ash boring project and um, the way that, um, maybe the intimate relation of the word turner to her craft um, allows for the convenience for the encounter between the former life of the tree and the new turned life of the tree as it were the um, which you know that project about the woodland ash borer you're saving those fragments of tree that have turned into wood and you're asking us to continually encounter them and to remember their life. And it reminds me of uh, something I learned about in graduate school, which is this idea of deep ecology. I don't know if you've read or if some of our listeners have read um, about, uh, I think there's a book called Do Trees Have Standing, um, which is about um, a court case that the Sierra Club brought in, I think it was in the 70s or any, anyways, perhaps before that, I don't, not super familiar with it, but what you say reminds me of this court case that I know not so much about, but that is, I think, an interesting way um, into this question that your work brings up, which is, do trees have standing legally? That is, like, are, do they belong to our community? Are they citizens? Do they have rights? Should they, pre, should they be protected? Um, so thinking expansively about what we mean by community. Um, mm -hmm. I think yeah. a Go lot ahead. of it is tied with the kind of empathy you can develop with anything really which is why um people fight for like animals rights um and i i read this book while i was making that project called the secret life of trees hidden life of trees i think they're they're two different books but they talked about things like how trees react to getting hurt how they also have energy that they can either choose to like grow into their canopy or down into their roots, how there's like a whole, also another secondary ecosystem of fungi, which connects trees to each other so that they can actually communicate. Um, I think it was something at like, it was like an inch every second or a quarter of an inch every second was how fast yeah. the signal would go. But the more you learn about things like that, the more I would definitely say if, everyone read that book, we would probably assume trees should have rights. Yeah, and you know, this is, um, as somebody who studies the 19th century, you know, I'm very interested in um, a kind of turn that was taken, I'm sorry, no pun intended, but a turn that was taken in the early 19th century, um, you know, towards the kind of instrumentalization of the forest and mm -hmm. um, the destruction of so many old growth trees. So I think one of the things that we're, you know, your work asks us to consider the Woodland Ash Borer work, among others, is about um, what, what is a more expansive definition of being? What is a more expansive definition of, um, of a being? You know, a tree as a being, you know, mushrooms as, a, as beings, um, you know, rather mm -hmm. than just these kind of instruments that we chop down and, and make furniture out of. And speaking of being and um, yeah, and, and the ways that we understand the, the live um, creatural community of our world, I'm wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit about, um, we have a question from our director, um, the museum's director, Marjorie Nathanson, who asks about movement in your work, which I think is really apropos, um, you know, to what we're talking about, um, mm. you know, beings, um, you know, the life of trees, the, 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 the care of the wood turner. So she asks, um, it seems like movement was very important to your earlier work. For instance, the one-legged stool and perhaps less important with your more recent basket work. So could you comment on that? Mm -hmm. um, I think, a lot of what I've taken away from getting more and more building experience is the idea that your world is malleable. Like if you can 
if you can build things, you can kind of solve all your own problems, you know? So I, um, like in the beginning, I definitely felt like I was just restricted by the chair. Um, and I mean, I'm not like a very big person too. And so a lot of the world that I experience is just like not built for me. Um, like executive office chairs that are meant to tip back. I cannot tip them back. I don't have enough weight or um, like things I can't reach. It all kind of sucks. And I don't want to like feel like I'm a victim in that world. And um, sorry, what was I getting at? Oh, so the, the body movement came kind of from that, which was um, uh, the best example I have is when I was little, my parents would have us do a lot of homework at the dining table and our chairs were not high enough because we were like eight. And so instead of telling us to like, hey, sit still, focus, which is what we learn in school, you know, just like sit still and read, they were like, okay, um, you don't have to contort yourself to that. They took apart our dining chairs, put two by fours underneath, gave us these little stools that we could rest our feet. Oh, and yeah. that was that. Like, you don't have to contort yourself into a world that you don't fit in. Mm. And that's the power of building. And I think also the power of teaching too. That's beautiful. And a wonderful way to, I think, end today's discussion, um, basically in the words or the the wonderful advice of your father, you know, that A plus B equals C, that in the uniqueness of your being, um, you can um, transform yourself and transform the world around you, i.e. vis-a-vis the two by fours, um, mm -hmm. to, to embrace um, the world in a way that makes something new and beautiful and um, brings us all together, like you taught those um, young women um, in Philadelphia, um, how to make a world and encounter a new world through this process of um, making art with wood. So um, thank you for all the various um, introductions to transformation and um, to, um, to care and to, um, to, the radical possibilities of furniture and wood working that you um, that you've given us today and thanks to our audience and um, we'll see you hopefully for the next event thank you happy sunday thanks everyone Bye. thanks janine